Also wir haben eingeladen zu einem sehr schwierigen Thema, zu einem Thema aus der vertrackten deutschen Geschichte, wie Ernst Bloch hier zu diesem Thema sagen würde. Es ist also gewissermaßen sperrig, es ist auch kein Thema, welches große Publika sozusagen aus dem Tagesgeschäft anlockt. Aber ich glaube, wir werden heute Abend gemeinsam erleben, dass es ein sehr wichtiges Thema ist, auch zum Selbstverständnis vieler Dinge, die die heutige Welt angehen. Und insofern freue ich mich zunächst, dass also neben mir Daniel Blattmann aus Jerusalem sitzt und heute unser Gast ist. Und wir beginnen gewissermaßen mit der heutigen Veranstaltung eine Lesereise. Ich werde gleich dazu etwas sagen. Bevor ich das mache, möchte ich unseren Gast vorstellen. Daniel Blattmann ist Direktor des Avraham Harman Institutes der Hebräischen Universität in Jerusalem. Das ist ein Institut, welches sich mit dem zeitgenössischen Judentum beschäftigt und der Namensgeber Avraham Harman ist 1916, glaube ich, geboren in London und 1992 in Jerusalem gestorben. Ein bekannter israelischer Diplomat, der in seiner Jugendzeit der britischen oder englischen zionistischen Bewegung beitrat, dann nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg den diplomatischen Dienst in Israel aufnahm, mehrere Stationen überlief, unter anderem Botschafter in den Vereinigten Staaten war und er war langjähriger Präsident der Hebräischen Universität in Jerusalem und ist einmal einerseits Namensgeber dieses äh, renommierten Institutes und gleichzeitig Ehrendoktor dieser Universität, Ehrendoktor für Verdienste für den Zionismus und für den israelischen Staat. Und äh, zum Gegenstand äh, dieser Lesereise, das ist also ein Buch, welches dieses Jahr im Rowold Verlag Hamburg erschienen ist, mit dem Titel Die Todesmärsche 1944-1945, das letzte Kapitel des nationalsozialistischen Massenmords, Ganz kurz dazu, erstmals ist dieses Buch auf Französisch 2008 in Paris erschienen. Dann ist 2010 eine hebräische Ausgabe oder auf Hebräisch in Jerusalem erschienen und von dieser Ausgabe ist dann 2011 diese deutsche Ausgabe übersetzt worden und erschienen. Und der Titel sagt es schon, das ist also ein sehr, sehr schwieriges Thema. Und Daniel Blattmann wird dann in seiner... Vorstellung in seinem Beitrag, glaube ich, sehr schnell auf den Kern dieses Buches kommen und warum dieses Buch im Jahre 2011 solche doch sehr wichtige Bedeutung hat. Vielleicht noch einmal ganz kurz von meiner Seite den Hintergrund. 1944 im Sommer, als die Rote Armee im Osten sozusagen weit, immer weiter nach Westen vorrückte, begann, begann die Nationalsozialisten Gefangenenlager, Vernichtungslager im Nordosten Europas, also im, den heutigen, im Raum der heutigen baltischen Staaten zu räumen, die dann in Richtung Zentralpolen ging und ab Sommer 1944 dann äh, wurden immer mehr sozusagen im Maße des Voranschreitens der, der Ostfront äh, diese Lager und äh, Konzentrationslager evakuiert und daraus speisten sich sozusagen der Gegenstand dieses Buches, die Todesmärsche, die also im Sommer 1944 den Anfang nahm und deren Schlusskapitel dann hier in Deutschland im Zusammenhang mit dem zusammenbrechenden Nationalsozialismus stattfand, mit teils sehr grausamen Begebenheiten und ich glaube, dass wir heute Abend einige Sachen dazu aufsprechen werden. Daniel Blattmann, was, äh, glaube ich, was ich herausgelesen habe aus diesem Buch, das ist eins und damit werde ich dann, äh, glaube ich, Ihnen das Wort gleich übergeben, ist, dass es also ähm, schon ein, ein, ähm, ein, etwas Besonderes ist. Das heißt, äh, es sind also Gefangene aus den verschiedenen Lagern, Institutionen der Vernichtung äh, des Nationalsozialistischen Reiches, vor allem aus dem Osten kommt, also der heutige äh, polnische Raum. Also Auschwitz, Großrosen, Stutthof sind solche äh, Gegenden, aus denen sich diese Todesmärsche dann wesentlich zusammensetzen, speisten mit den Gefangenen. Äh, und äh, zugleich wurde sozusagen der Ort äh, der Verwahrung, der Ort der Vernichtung ein anderer. Es wurde ein offenerer Raum, es wurde ein Raum, in dem also sehr viele verschiedene Menschengruppen sozusagen aufeinander trat und wo bestimmte spezifische Erscheinungen hervortraten und das ist im Grunde genommen der Gegenstand dieses Buches und soweit äh, man das auch aus den Rezensionen, Rezensionen lesen kann, ist äh, die Art und Weise, wie die Blattmann diesen Gegenstand darstellt, äh, schon sehr äh, 
sehr etwas Neues, wo er also versucht, ein bestimmtes neues Licht sozusagen für uns heute lebenden, hier in Deutschland tätigen Menschen herauszufinden. Sehr vielen Dank, Daniel Blattmann, dass Sie diese weite Reise zu uns angetreten haben und ich darf Ihnen jetzt zunächst für Ihren Vortrag, Einführungsvortrag zu dem Buch das Wort geben. Good evening, now we switch to English. First of all, I would like to thank all who are responsible for bringing me in. The Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, mainly, and uh, my publisher in Hamburg. It is a great pleasure for me to uh, be here <clears throat> and during the coming 12 days in other parts of Germany to talk and to uh, expose my book, which uh, As, as uh, was mentioned here, it was published this year in Germany, in the States, and other places. And uh, I must uh, happily ad admit that uh, it, it rose, a lot of, rose up a lot of questions and, and debates on many questions that were, to my mind, neglected many years concerning the final step or the final stage of the Nazi genocide. So I prepared the uh, sort of highlights, I would say, uh, from the book, uh, which I would like to read from, uh, 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 to you. And I would be very appreciate if uh, we can have a discussion right after that and, and to hear comments from, from anyone who would like to comment. In one of the, <coughs> in one of the, numer <coughs> the numerous de testimonies by death march of survivors, Abraham Kimmelmann, Kimmelmann, Kimmelmann describes an incident during the evacuation from Auschwitz that became etched in his memory. Kimmelmann, born in 1928 in Dombrowa Gornica, Poland, spent the war in Sosnowiec's ghetto and then in the Auschwitz labor camp. In January 1945, he was transferred from one of the labor camps to Grossrosen and from there to Buchenwald. His early testimony on his experiences during the Nazi occupation, taken down by the American psychologist David Boder in August 1946, focuses on the evacuation and the death marches. He recalled an event in which a prisoner Who could, not, who could not kept walking and realized that his destiny was sealed, he would be murdered by one of the guards in a matter of minutes, stood where he was and waited for his fate. As Kimmelmann told the story, and I quote, that was something that one is not able to tell. A man full of his senses, in whom everything is still functioning, He is feeble and can't run anymore. He stands by himself under a tree, his eyes shining like reflectors. And he waits for the moment when the whole formation will have passed by till the Hindus guard will arrive with a block leader, also an SS man, who will shot him. Can you imagine what this is? A man with his full mental abilities, who knows what is going on, and he waits for his death. And so every three, ten meters, one shows somebody standing under a tree or sitting down, and such men would be shot and thrown into the ditch. End of quote. An almost identical event is described in, in the memoirs of Robert Antel, which were also written right after the war in 1946. As, as a prisoner, Antel was completely different from Abraham Kimmelmann. He was a non-Jew, active in the French resistance, whom the Gestapo arrested in Paris in 1944. Antel was sent to Buchenwald, but soon transferred transferred to Bahn Gandersheim labor camp. On April 2, still small, <coughs> this small camp was evacuated. 
Out of its 450 inmates at the time, around 40 were murdered before they were march marched out. The 150 who survived the operation arrived in Dachau on April 27. In his memoir, Anselm described how a friend of his, Francis, decided that he no longer had the strength to continue and that it was useless to struggle against his fate. Another friend, Paul, tried to convince Francis that he must go on and could not give up now when liberation so close at hand. In Anthem's in Anthem words, and I quote again, maybe Francis really cannot go on anymore. Paul has no way to knowing, of knowing, neither does Francis. When he said, I'm staying here, his body decided to quit too. Maybe his time too has come, the time when, the, when he refuses to hear any more about this. Francis knows he'll be killed if he, decides to, if he decided to stay. And Paul can do anything about it. By now, he doesn't even the strength to examine the significance of his own powerless or the fatality of Francis' decision. It all takes place in haze, and Paul has barely enough strength to argue with Francis. End of quote. This incident highlights one of the important, important characteristics of the period of the death marches. This is an existential situation that was common to the prisoner being evacuated, whatever the ethnicity or the, or the circumstances of the months of the evacuation and, the, and death marches. A reader of survivors' testimonies gets the impression that the last month of the war imprinted themselves as worse than any earlier time. Many of the prisoners, particularly the Jews and the Poles, reported that despite the extended, the extended periods of imprisonment, starvation, and deprivation in the ghettos and camps, where they saw their families and communities being deported and murdered before their eyes, the death marches were the most hellish experience of all. So what made the survivors remember the death marches as such a murderous period with so little hope for survival as constructed with the other stages of the Nazi genocide. What distinguished the structure, execution, sequence of events and the murderous behavior from the earlier years when hundreds of thousands were slaughtered by the various death, death squads set up by the regime. In my view, a number of factors, of factors combined to create this unique, unique bloody situation in the, warning, in the warning weeks of the war during what is the historiography of the Nazi genocide refers to as the period of the death marches. Before I, before I describe these factors, I would like to begin with a historiographic note from a personal point of view. In 1996, Daniel Yona Goldhagen visited Yad Vashem and participated in a seminar along with a group of Israeli Holocaust researchers. This was the period of the great controversy, controversy about his well-known book. One of Goldhagen's claim is that the death marches the last act of Nazi ruthlessness, provide, <coughs> provide the strongest evidence of the murderous ideological determination to complete the mission they took up from the day Hitler came into power. The annihilation of, the every, of every last Jew they could lay their hands on. These killing, killings took place after the outcome of the war was no longer in doubt, when it was clear that there was nothing more 
that could be done with the Jewish prisoners since there were no longer any real possibility of working them to death. But the pathological anti-Semitism of the murderous convoy guards was more powerful than any other factor, so, so they kept slaughtering their, their victims to the very last day. Goldhagen's book includes a detailed description of the death march of a group of Jewish women from the Helmbrechts labor camp, which he offers as the main evidence to his claims. In my book about the death marches, I dealt with the harrowing incident of the evacuation from Helmbrechts, and I arrived at conclusions substantially different from Goldhagen's. In any case, after my encounter with Goldhagen at Yad Vashem, I went back to read, to reread, Anthelm's L'Espèce Humaine, the human race. This left me with unsettled, with, un, with unsettled with Goldhagen's firm conclusions about the death marches. After all, Antel writes about a camp that, to the best of our knowledge, never held a single Jewish prisoner, a camp whose prisoners were evacuated in, an, in a horrific death march that fewer than half of them survived, in which the murderous attitude towards the victim was no different that from the killers of the Jewish women during the Helmbrecht's evacuation. So how can this be reconciled with the conclusion about the Germans' pathological, anti-Semitic bloodthirstiness even during the period of the death marches as, Gold, as Goldhagen describes? The similar fate of prisoners with different backgrounds and ethnicities who for uh, diverse, uh, diverse uh, reasons were brought to the camp and from there evacuated and forced on the death marches, led me to conclude that, ma that we must examine the final man month of the Nazi genocide from a different angle than which historians have been using. How then can this period be characterized? What makes it unique in the chronicle of the Nazi genocide? I will touch on three main aspects of this uniqueness. The first one I call the period and the awareness of the impending Stundel Null. The circumstances that led to the decision to implement the final solution in 1941 have been, uh, have been the focus of extensive historiographic dis discourse and analysis. Without going into various claims advanced by scholars, it is conventional to posit that Barbarossa, followed by the expansion of the campaign on the Eastern Front in fall 1941, was an important element in Hitler's decision to set the murder machine in motion. Some hold that the decision to exterminate the Jews was directly related to the euphoria that settled upon the Nazi leadership, leadership in the light of the Soviet Union's anticipated defeat and the consequent desire to complete this, this historical, historic task, the annihilation of the Jewish enemy, while simultaneously crushing Bolshevism. Other scholars maintain that, maintain that it was the complications that began to, upper, uh, to appear on the Eastern Front in late 1941, followed by the United States entrance into the war in December 1941, that produced the decision not to postpone the liquidation of, of the Jews until after the war was won and to launch the operation immediately. In 1941, when the Nazi murder campaign began, two groups victims were singled out. First, of course, the Jews, and then Soviet prisoners of war. As time went on, other groups were also targeted. This campaign was conducted within a historical era whose outcome 
seemed clear. A military victory on the Eastern Front and the establishment of the Thousand Year Reich. And with it in and within and with it the Ethiopian racist empire that Himmler and his henchmen had been working towards as part of the Generalplan Ost since 1940. This historical period uh, fostered the establishment of a system of terror and murder which began to function in the summer of 1941 and was expanded and refined in early 1942 with the start of Aktion Reinhardt and the planning of the large-scale death machinery of Auschwitz and Majdanek. This was not just physical infrastructure. It was also a bureaucracy of death and trained personnel, formed unit, rec uh, recruiting engineers and technicians, and deported hundreds of thousands of people from all over Europe to the death camp. By 1945, hardly anything remained of this system. The final campaign of the, of the, of the Nazi genocide took place at a time when it was clear to most of the participants that the ultimate defeat was a matter of months, if not weeks away. Although many of, of, of its senior functionaries found their way to concentration camp system in January or February 1945, after the camps in Poland had been evacuated to Germany. The ordered issues were unclear. The senior echelons were not always aware of them, and the, and the retreat and evacuation were extraordinary, extraordinarily chaotic. If we consider the impact of the time factor of on how the genocide played out and try to understand how it influenced the unfolding of events, it is clear that the slaughter at the end of the war were completely irrelevant to, realize, to, to, to realizing the vision of the future that many Germans had endured, uh, uh, sorry, uh, endured four years earlier. In other words, thousands of Germans kept slaughtering hundreds of thousands of victims until the day they surrendered, not because they were participating for various, reason, for various uh, reasons in the organized system that powered the annihilation, and not because they were fulfilling their national mission of a vision of the future but for completely different motivations. The facilities of mass terrorism developed by Nazi Germany made their first appearance only a few weeks after Hitler's rise to power. The concentration camp system developed in 1934 was no secret. Almost all of the large camps were established, established and operated in proximity to villages and towns and even cities. Sachsenhausen or Rheinenburg was about 35 kilometers from Berlin, Buchenwald about 10 kilometers from Weimar, Mauthausen about 20 kilometers from Linz, and of course there are other examples. Until 1943, almost an entire decade after the concentration camp uh, after the, the, the construction uh, on the uh, concentration camps began, there was a strict separation between two domains, the territory where the civilian's population lived and the atrocities in the camps. The civilians who lived near the camps saw them as frightening installations. Knowledge of what went on behind the fences was no secret. Nevertheless, the camp system was a closed world intended for punishment, removal, and isolation of those considered to be the ultimate enemies of the political and the social order. Opponents of the regime, moral offenders, incorrigible criminals, and their like. 
But in 1943, the encounter between the camp population and the civilian population in the Reich itself <coughs> changed dramatically. The hundreds of satellite camps set up to serve the needs of the total war and the military supply system bought, brought camps inmates into direct contact with the residents of the towns where the factories were located. Hundreds of towns in Germany and Austria were con con converted into closely, closely knit economic systems composed of three separate, separate, uh, of three separate but overlap the overlapping worlds. The town and its inhabitants, the camp and its prisoners, and the factory where the two groups encountered each other. For the prisoners, the results of this encounter were usually disastrous. The second point, the community of murderers and the identity of the victims. It is quite impossible, sorry, it is quite impossible to sketch a standard profile of the Nazi perpetrator. perpetrator. Scholars have shown the diversity of skills with regard to their social background, motivation to do their job, and the political or ideological notions that drove them to join the murder operation or enlist in the units that carried out. To, to this, we must add the significant functions of murderers who were not German, including Lithuanians, Latvian, Romanian, Ukrainian, and more. Nevertheless, we can say without response, without, without, I'm sorry, we can say with responsible certainty that most of the perpetrators of 1941-1944 worked as part of a group, unit, or organization that was assigned the task, whether or not they volunteered for such groups. This generalization applies to the Eisenstruppen set by Heydrich before the invasion to the Soviet Union, to the reservists of the Ost, of the Ordnungspolizei who took part in the massacres of Jews in the general government in 1941, to the units of the local Ukrainian nationalities organized in the Eastern Galicia in 1942, uh, affiliated with the criminal police, the Kripo, or the railway police, uh, Banschutz, who, were, who by 1943 were more than 400 strong. And of course, we can add the, part the, the Lithuanian uh, partisan units to this group as well. It is also includes the various Wehrmacht units that took part in the massacres in the Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union other SS units, concentration camp persons, the, TR, the T4 experts, the, those who were responsible for the euthanasia, and others. Not all of the hundreds of thousands uh, uh, persons in these units enlisted because they wanted to help exterminate the Jews. Most had no, in, in, uh, no uh, uh, inkling that they, would, that they would be called upon to implement genocide. Nonetheless, they were part of a military and police establishment they, were, they wore uniforms, and they believed in the political and ideological mission of the regime they served or fought for, even if some of them originally had different reasons of enlisting. By the late 1944, this motley crew of murderers had all but disappeared. The war had scattered its members. Most of the units that uh, had implemented mass murder during the previous years were disma dismantled or disintegrated. The death marches briefly produced a community of murderers whose composition and motives were even more heterogeneous than before. 
It was composed of the remnants of the historical groups of perpetrators, chiefly those who had served in the concentration camps and organized the, machine, the, the, the marching columns of the inmates for the evacuation, supplemented by new groups who had no henceforth, uh, who had no heretofore been involved in, in, in instigating and carrying out the genocide. The appearance of the later was closely linked to, to the different uh, spatial domain and time period in which the last act of the slaughter took place. During the, prepara the, the preparations of, for evacuation, the camps, uh, the, the evacuation of the camps, couples, mostly Germans, but also Poles and Volksdeutsche from Eastern Europe, began to be conscripted into the ranks of the guards. Often they were given uniforms and weapons. This, per, this prisoner's turned uniformed guard now crossed the fusy line that has existed between their status as inmates and their functions as SS henchmen. And there was no turning back. These newly, these newly, uh, newly minted guards, violent and murderous treatment of the prisoners could be even more extreme than that of the SS guards. But their motives for enlisting as murderers different from those of the veteran agents of genocide. They were opportunists, generally with criminal background, who had crossed the line while still in the camp and felt they belonged, especially because most of them were German uh, ancestry, with the lords of the camps, rather than with the rabble of prisoners who were mainly Russians, Poles, Frenchmen, communists, Jews, you name it. By joining the ranks of the guards, they improved their status, privileges, and odds of survival, and more importantly, believed that they would be able to save themselves at, at the last minute, whereas the inmate's fate had already been sealed. A large number of these new killer were ordinary citizens. It is clearly problematic to make sweeping generalization about how millions of German citizens reacted when confronted by the death marchers late in the war. Many of the prisoners who managed to escape told of citizens who opened their hearts and homes to them, provided them with food and shelter, and then handed them over safe and sound to the liberated forces. In general, though, the citizens saw the prisoners as violent and threatening. Not only did their appearance uh, evoke horror, filthy and emaciated, fighting like animals for every rotten scrap of food they could, hand, they could find. They were also identified with the, with the sworn enemies of Germany, who would have no hesitation about taking cruel revenge on the Germans on the moment they were freed by the American, the British, or the Red Army. When the camp were being evacuated, prisoners were mercilessly killed by German citizens who had never before take part in the execution or the extermination. They, tran they translated prisoner threatening otherness and they countless oral stories of rapes and assaults committed by escaped or liberated prisoners into some form of complicity in the crime. Some hunted down the, the uh, exhausted prisoners in their hiding places and delivered them to the convoy guards. But quite a few pursued the escapees and killed them with their own hands because there were no longer any, uh, any guards to take custody of them. Of equal importance, the civilians gave 
broad support to the convoy guards and escorts, urging them to get the prisoners away from their homes as quickly as possible by killing them in cold blood if, it, if, if, if needed be. These new recruitees included older men enrolled in the false troop and teenagers of the Hitler Jugend, along with minor partner functionaries, local policemen, and, fire, and, and even firefighters. Sometimes this murder squad was joined by soldiers whose unit had disintegrated as they retreated deeper into Germany. These casual killers were supplemented, of course, by the surviving camp staff and the SS men who had begun the death marches with the prisoners. Violence, terrorism, and murdering the enemies of the regime was the old hate of this last group. In the context, of, tot of this total collapse, the last victims of Nazi genocide took an identity that was different from the victims of the earlier stages. At the, at the height of the, genocide, of the genocide campaign, Nazi ideology had, catalog as, had catalog catalogued the victims into clearly defined groups. First were the Jews, the great enemy of the race and the folk followed in several uh, 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 gradations by other groups that were killed, persecuted, exiled, or imprisoned, each with, each with a different fate. Soviet prisoners of war, gypsies, Poles, Ukrainians, communists, members of the French resistance, Jehovah Witnesses, homosexuals, and so on. All prisoners now were enemies who were still alive just when the German nation was experiencing its greatest trauma, the utter collapse, the sense that its history was over. This is when many Germans decided that the enemy, the prisoners, had no right to live not only because they were dangerous and, mercy, and, and, and uh, menacing, but also because they pres the, the, their presence was a living evidence of the defeat, the disaster, and the trauma that uh, it brings upon. Now, the third point. How, 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 still have time? The third point, which I call the encounter between murderer and victim. The last month of the Nazi genocide produced a new type of encounter between murderer and victim, one that could not have existed in any previous constellation of the extermination. The, uh, the depersonalization of the victim is a well-known and uh, a, a recurrent motive of genocide and mass murder. It had, it, had, it had already appeared in the Nazi campaign. A clear distance, more than just physical, separated killer from victim and kept the former from having any real contact with those he exterminated. The million of Jews who shoved into gas chamber of the death camps, the millions of Soviet POWs who withdrew away in the prison pens of Ukraine and Belarusia, the hundreds of thousands of Poles who were cruelly expelled ex 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 from their homes, and the hundreds of thousands of concentration camp inmates who were worked without mercy and perished by tens of thousands in the last stage, stages of the war. To the killers, they were anonymous. They were faceless, nameless, lacking of identity. Just an undifferentiated, undifferentiated mess that had to be whipped out. Franz Stöngel, the commander of Treblinka, hit the nail on the head 
in his interview with journalist and researcher Gita Sereni, it was in the uh, mid-1970s, and he said the following. When I was on a trip once years later in Brazil, my train stopped next, next to a slaughterhouse. The cattle in the pens, hearing the noise of the, of the train, trotted up the fence and stared at the train. They were very close to my window, one crowding the other, looking at me through, the, through that fence. That's just how the people looked in Treblinka. Trustingly, just before they went into the tins, cargo. They were cargo. But during the death marches, a different sort of interaction between killer and victim emerged. The fact that the guards had to march alongside their prisoners for weeks or travel with them in overcrowded trains created a new and multifaceted relationship between the two groups. When evacuation of the camps began, many of the guards were men in their 40s or older who were no longer fit for active military service and had been transferred to the camps, to the camp detail from 1933, 1943 on, as, a lab, as the labor camp system was expanding rapidly. Many saw this assignment as a pointless burden and were disgust, disgusted by the violent and murderous nature of the camp, of the camp, of the camp regime. Of course, this should not be taken to be representative or a general phenomenon. Camp guards murdered tens of thousands of prisoners during the evacuation process. But many instances of which prisoners were uh, 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 perished, turned over the guards, or killed with active assistance of rank and file citizens, were almost always accompanied with demonizations of the prisoners. They were described as bloodthirsty communists, of whom the city or town had to be cleaned, cleansed. This notion produced the macabre folklore of the zebra hunt named of, for prisoners strip uniforms. Robert Antlem noticed that the, time, that the time came during the march when the prisoner no longer interested the SS men who wanted to let the group escape so they could desert and flee for their lives. But the local Gestapo officer forbade those res uh, uh, responsible for the evacuation to release the prisoners and order them to keep marching towards Dachau. In another case, noted by Antlem, local Volkssturm wanted to kill the prisoners but were prevented from doing so by the SS guards. It was not that the later had suddenly discovered the virtue of compassion, but only that they were still determined to follow their orders, which were that the prisoners be conducted to Dachau. But for the members of the local Volkssturm units, the prisoners were dangerous enemies who had strayed into their own territory and there was no reason to keep them alive. <coughs> Let me conclude with a point that I uh, coined or described as methodological conclusion. And I will try to take you to a different perspective of the death marches, something that I'm working on as my current research, I'm doing it now, death martyrs and genocide in the 20th century. Let us try to enlarge the scope of this phenomenon. Were well, the death marches in the closing months of the Second World War 
world, world, I'm sorry, were the death marches in the closing months of the Second World War unique among all genocidal episodes of the, 90, of the 20th century? Were they exclusively, exclusively a function of the situation that developed in the concentration camps in Germany during the final collapse, or have they had historical parallels elsewhere? Genocide and political mass murder, accompanied by deportations and death marches, begin and develop differently than any other case. There are numerous number of 20th century examples of this. The genocide by the German Imperial Army and the German settlers in Southwest Africa, now Namibia, between 1904 and 1906. The Armenian genocide of 1915-1916. The Romanian deportation and death marches of approximately 300 uh, 3,300,000 3, Jews from Bukovina, Bessarabia, and Dohoroi into Transistria, that is in the Ukrainian, in 1941. And of course, the death marches during the evacuation of the Nazi concentration camps in 1944 and 1945. There are a few other smaller example, examples which I'm not uh, 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 getting into details now. There are differences in all the elements we know from genocidal studies. The, the, ideology, the ideology guiding the mass murder, the way in which the decision is taken and the implementation apparatus is set up, the supervision and the management of the, its execution and the reactions of the murderers and the victims. The decision makers are not always aiming at the comprehensive or total extermination of the victim group, but neither do they, they explicitly deny this objective. Consequently, the field echelons have to develop special mechanism, not only in order to understand what they have been asked to do, but also and chiefly to define the bounds of the genocide and its ultimate goals, as well as to find the personnel to carry it out. This is a kind of genocide that takes place in an open space of society and ordinary citizens. The public exposure to the atrocities requires murderers, victims, and those whom genocide studies call bystanders to process, to process the encounter in different ways. But this last term, uh, uh, um, commonplace in Holocaust studies, is not appropriate for the civilians who were exposed to the death marches. They were not neutral bystanders, but active participants in the event, even because of their existing in, in, in the place not only because they were personally influenced and uh, 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 were, I'm sorry, not only because their, their very presence influenced the conduct of the murderers and victims, but also because many of them crossed the boundary from being passive overseas observers and joined the murderers for various and sundry reasons. Finally, study of death marches allows, allow, uh, allows us to compare the diverse ideologies and theories that influenced genocide in the 19th century so that we can produce a typology of genocide. And I also believe that it can provide us with a deeper understanding of the relationship between the Holocaust and other genocides in the 20th century. Thank you for your attention.